to talk about unit testing best practices as soon as that shows up. Um, I'm not going to spend any time just to, if, you, if you aren't convinced about whether or not unit testing is a good idea, I'm not going to be talking about why you should be unit testing. Uh, in the same way that I wouldn't talk about why you should go to the gym. If you're one of those people that's like, I went to the gym, I tried exercise, I did it for a couple of weeks, I was weaker, so I'm not going to do that. So I'm not going to try to justify to you whether or not unit testing is a good idea. Instead, we're just going to be talking about best practices. So uh, as you saw before, I do like Star Wars. Um, little known fact, I was the stunt double in that film. Uh, I like to play a little bit of a game just for a brain break. Anybody ever do these things where you've you got to try to figure it out? So this is a guess the speaker game. Who can tell me what speaker this is? Come on, we got a lot of we got a lot of IQ points in the room. Somebody's got to know. It's one of the speakers from today. Who is it? What? There we go, Kim Maida. Everybody get it, Kim Maida? Come on. All right. So there's going to be a couple more of these spread throughout just to make this talk a little bit more interesting, get a little bit of an uh, audience going. Do I have to explain this? Does anybody need, does anybody need to explain this? Don't, don't feel ashamed that you don't, uh, you don't get it. I, I made them up, so uh, <laughs> they're, pro they're probably a little off. All right. My first best practice we're going to talk about is to write your tests first. Why should we write your tests first, especially when there are a significant number of people who do not believe in writing tests first? Well, for the first thing, no tests do no good, right? Writing test first assures you that you will have tests. This is the only 100% foolproof way to assure that you actually have tests is to write your tests first. Has anybody here ever intended to write a test and then not gotten around to it? I know that there's way more people that have been in that situation than are raising hands. We all have, because we have deadlines, we have bosses, we have pressure. Um, there's a lot of reasons why um, we don't write tests. As I said, deadlines. Uh, hero syndrome, this is my favorite one. Come back from Monday and one of the team members stayed late all weekend long, finishing that feature that wasn't gonna get finished for the sprint. They worked, you know, they just slaved away. They got that feature done. I'm the hero, they say. And cool, where are the unit tests? Well, I can't be the hero and do the unit tests. Somebody needs to come along after me and mop up my mess. So another reason why we don't write tests. Um, and you don't get promoted for writing the tests. You get promoted for getting the feature done, right? We love that hero syndrome. Uh, tests can be hard. That's another reason why we don't write them. You have, to, you have to think, you have to make sure you write good tests, and uh, it's a different kind of coding. You have to think differently than just getting the functionality to work. So that's another reason why we don't write it. Another reason we don't write tests is because our code sucks, and it's hard to test that code. Another good reason why we don't write tests. But excuses do not make working or well-designed code, right? But there is what I call the grand theory of testability, which states that there is a high correlation between testable code and good code, right? Certainly there's a very high correlation between tested code and working code, but in addition to making your code work, tests also tend to make our code better. Code that is testable is code that is better. It's small, it's encapsulated, it's, uh, it's isolated from other pieces, it's easy to work with, and a lot of code smells are avoided because it's a, a hard to test code that has a lot of code smells. Excuses do not make our code work, and they don't make our code well designed. Uh, also, hopes don't, right? The not writing tests. Okay, so that's first. That's our first best practice: is write the tests first. Our second best practice is to structure your tests properly. So this is the AAA structure. Uh, there's a Couple, there's another variation on saying the, uh, what the pieces are, the given one then, but it's essentially the same thing. In the AAA structure, we start off, the first A is arrange. We arrange our code, and right? we arrange the situation. Then we act, we take some kind of an action, so we set our code up and so arrange it, get it all ready, and we do something to, this, to the system. And then finally, we assert what should be different. If you, uh, 
are familiar with state machines. This is initial state, state transition, new state. Right? That's how tests should be structured. So I got a little code sample example up here of a test. Right? We have our initial arrange there. We create an order. In this case, the initials or the uh, arrangement is just the initialization of a new object. Then we act. We call the set customer and pass in a null value. And then we assert, hey, uh, our customer is valid function should uh, return true. Is customer valid should return true when we have a null customer? Maybe it should be null or it should be false depending on your test case. But whatever it is, arrange, act, assert. I personally like to put a little bit of vertical or um, white space in between those three sections. Helps me to kind of see what's going on. So a little, little personal tip there is to put a little white space in between those sections as well. Next best practice is to know isolated versus integration tests. So hopefully when I talked about writing your tests first, I got at least a few people who said, mm, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Writing tests first, TDD is dumb. So this might be the other thing that I hope I get at least a few people questioning me, but this is something, this is probably my most hated part of Angular, and that is uh, the difference between isolated and integration tests. It's how many people, people here know what the difference is between an isolated test and an integration test in Angular? In Angular. With hands went down, had some hands go up and go down. In, in Angular, the difference between an isolated test and an integration test. Okay, just one. So, and how many people here actually code Angular? Okay, how many people here write tests in Angular? Okay, so to me this is a huge problem that we don't understand the difference between an isolated and integration test and I blame mostly the Angular team and a little bit the CLI team for this and we'll, I'll show you why here. Um, so let's talk about the difference between isolated and integration test. I'm gonna do a little code example here. Except, there we go. All right, everybody, we can see what's going on here, right? What do we have here? This is a test. Does this look familiar to those of you who do write tests? All right, we got our imports up at the, the top, we got our describes, before, a couple before each is, and then finally down there at the bottom is our test, line 21, right? What am I testing here? Uh, I'm just testing that components order, component.order.id should be one, set to one, so uh, it's some kind of, it's a default value for this customer's component, we're testing the customer's component. So we go down to line 22 and we actually see what's truly going on in this test. When we got a default customer, then its order property should have an ID property, and that should be one, right? And then, but it took us 21 lines to get down to starting actually a meaningful portion of our test, okay? So I'm gonna show you a super, super, super cool trick. This is, this is gonna be magic, right? Most of you aren't gonna understand this at all. I know that this might be earth shattering. The idea that you can do something this crazy. And I know I just, I coded that so fast, right? Like nobody had time to grok all that code that I just wrote. And I apologize for that. I just don't have time to spend, you know, the 30 minutes it would take to explain exactly what I did. But um, this does the exact same thing. This test does exactly the same thing as the previous version of this test. In fact, just to make sure I did this right, I put it over here. Oh, wait, I apologize, I missed one thing, calling the NG on a net. So, there we go, there's my, there's my correct version, little bug I wrote it myself. Um, this, this code here does exactly the same thing as the, as the test that we saw before. Okay, now, can anybody guess, let's, let, me, let me go back and I'm gonna undo what I did here. So go back to our initial, our initial version. Okay, looking at this code, and we're seeing like we got our test bed, configure testing module, all this sort of stuff, and looking at this code. Can anybody guess which code is faster? Anybody have a guess? I mean, that is gonna be pretty difficult to get, make that guess. We might have to do like a, a poll the room, right? It might be split down the middle. But uh, if you guessed, just by the gut, 
that this code is faster than this code, you would be correct, right? And we're not talking a little bit faster, we're talking an order of magnitude faster. The test bed itself has a ton of stuff going on inside of it. All kinds of stuff goes on inside the test bed. Now, on a single test, you will not notice the difference, right? Uh, especially with some of the overhead of Karma doing its thing. But when we're talking about wanting to run our entire suite of tests for, which uh, in a really large suite, maybe you don't run your entire suite of tests normally during development. Maybe you're just running tests around the features that you're building, which is a, a good practice. But occasionally you'll want to run your entire suite of tests. So when we're talking about 1,000 tests, 5,000 tests, 10,000 unit tests, the difference can be the difference between a minute, minute and a half, and 20 minutes, right? That's the kind of difference this can make. There's other differences between the two of these things, right? Um, just the complexity of what's going on here to get the same result, right? So complexity is another thing. The maintenance, maintainability of this, there's significant differences between these two things. Now, it is true that the default test, so this one, this kind of test can do more things than this kind of test can, right? This kind of test can do less things, and what it can't do is it cannot test your template, right? You can't, this is not, this has no template. This is a component without a template. It's just a piece of JavaScript code, which shock, if you weren't prepared for this, I'm gonna just rock your world. Angular is actually JavaScript, right? So our components, they're just JavaScript classes. Um, this is just a JavaScript class that I just created by calling new on it, which Again, I don't know if anybody knew this, but you can actually initialize a component by calling new on it. You should never do it in a live code, but in a test, this is totally valid, right? So I can't test the template, but I can just test everything in my component, which is where the code that I write lives, just not my HTML. And the, the fact of the matter is, you'll find that a lot of what you need to test lives in the component, and a little of what you might need to test is going to live in the template, and a lot of times, you may not need to test anything in the template, in which case, Doing all of this is completely unnecessary for any of those tests. And, and you can write this for just the tests that test the template. So this is called an integration test. And I actually completely disagree with this terminology, but I didn't make that up. Somebody else whose name rhymes with uh, Shmishko made that term up. And uh, um, so integration tests, this is an integration test. This here, this is an isolated test. Right? No test bed, uh, none of that. It's just a very simple, just JavaScript only test. But Karma runs this the same. If I run this, if I just do ng test or npm test, I'm going to get exactly the same. This, it's going to pick this up, it's going to execute this test just the same as the other test. It's totally fine. So that is the difference between isolated and integration tests, is that fact. And therefore, the, next, the best practice here is know the difference between isolated and integration tests and know when you need to do each one and then prefer isolated tests is my next best practice. This is, um, there's a lot of reasons for why we should prefer our isolated tests. First, they're simpler, they're quicker as I had discussed before, they're easier to write, they're easier to read, they're easier to maintain. There's a lot of reasons to prefer these isolated tests. Again, you cannot test the template in an isolated test, but the fact of the matter is, uh, what goes into the template is often a very low value to write tests around it. Not always, but often. Oftentimes what goes into our template is a very low value to test, right? Do you really need to test that you constructed that ng4 loop correctly? Do you really need a unit test around that? You probably don't. There might be some complex stuff going on in the, in the template that you do want to test. But a lot of times we're writing tests around, we, we can write tests around very simple things that are just not likely to break, right? So I'm not one of those people who says that you should write tests around every possible thing that you can test. I believe that you should write tests around the things that are meaningful to test and that the value of the test is very high and the cost of the test is very low. And if the test takes a really long time to write, the cost goes up. If the test is really difficult to maintain as the code changes, the cost goes up, right? And so our value that's up here, we start increasing the costs of our tests and pretty soon we, we haven't gotten the value out of our tests that we can get. 
but when you can write a simple, quick test that takes just a few lines of code and test what you need to test and actually have that functionality fixed in place and know when you've introduced a logic bug, which is what isolated tests can do because the logic generally lives in our components, then you get a lot of value for very little cost. And that way, when I, when I hear, I hear this oftentimes. One of the reasons I don't like unit tests is because I go in and do a major refactoring and all of a sudden I got 20, 30 broken tests, right? My litmus test for good unit tests is that I can go in and delete all the tests and it doesn't bother me because I can recreate them in a short amount of time. Maybe the only thing that I would want to keep is the name of the test so I know what the test is supposed to cover, but the content, delete it and recreate it very quickly. That is a good criteria for what a good test is, a good unit test. If I've got a unit test that is so many lines of code and was so difficult to craft that I would be scared to delete it, then to me that's a, essentially a testing code smell. All right, quick break. Guess the speaker, Who's, what speaker is this? <laughs> You're right, who's that it? Say it loud. Mike Hardington. Everybody get it? That's a that's sing, sing minus s. All right. Moving on. Next, next best practices. Here we got to. I'm going to go through a series of things never to do in your tests. All right. So first off, never in your test should you use an if statement. You should never branch inside of a test. Why? Because a test is built to test a specific scenario. And if there is an if in your test, that means that you're testing two scenarios at the same time, which a test is deterministic. A test should always produce the same result. If you have anything non-deterministic, you should isolate that away from your tests. So a test should never have an if branch inside of it. If you see an if branch inside of a test, that is, we're, we're beyond the code smell, right? This is definitely do not put if, any kind of branching, I, I include all kinds of branching in this, if statements, switch statements, never have, a, never have an if inside of your test. Instead, if you have a simple if that has two branches, write two tests. Don't write one test that somehow, I don't know, randomly chooses between the two branches, right? No, you do not use if statements inside of your tests. Next, don't use loops, all right? Um, let's see if I do have a little bit of code here to look at for looping. Um, Oh, I got the code in the slide, that's right. I do have some code here about loops. So um, we're, instead of using loops, create custom mattress, so let's look at this, what I've got over here, let's, this code, just take, we'll take a quick little second to go through this. Um, we're testing that um, whatever our client should, only contain, should contain only customers, so client.retrieve customers, and then we have the client has this customers field, and we're checking each customer and saying, hey, each customer object should have an ID, and it should have a customer name that both are not null, right? Seems like a fairly reasonable test, but I'm using that for each, which is essentially a loop, right? So I'm looping inside of my test, I'm making my test more complex. But in Jasmine and in just about every other unit uh, testing framework, you can write custom matchers. So instead of that, I can do this. Uh, client equals new client, retrieve customers, and then expect client got customers dot to all be customers, right? So I can do something like this and avoid the loop. Usually when we see loops, oftentimes it's about this, but a lot of times we're looping about other weird things like we're running multiple test cases in a loop, right? And that's a special circumstance to be able to run multiple test cases. Like say we were testing our multiply function. We wanted to know that if I multiplied two and two, I got four, and two and three, I got six, and two and four, I get eight, right? And I wanna test all those cases. To me, that's a decent amount of test coverage, right? You might think to do a loop because why write three tests? But in that case, just about every unit testing framework out there has this, is, has this feature called a parameterized test. Um, so parameterized tests allow you to feed in a set of values and then run the test multiple times against those values and there's some expected output value or set of output values. Jasmine supports this not inherently, you have to add a little plug into it, but other unit testing frameworks also support this. So avoiding, unit, avoid, avoiding the for loop inside of your test, you don't need the for loop. If you, see, if you see it in the case that I was showing you where we were testing like that, hey, everything within an array is this, right? Don't do that. Instead, write a custom matcher. If you only have two or three items, then maybe you just write each one, but zero, one, and two are all, are all that. But when you're trying to do that, hey, I wanna test multiple cases with different inputs, different outputs, 
go and get a parameterized, if it's Jasmine, go find the parameterized, it's called parameterized tests. I don't have enough time to, in this, to talk about that, but you can go and you just Google Jasmine parameterized tests and you can find out how to do that. And in other unit testing frameworks, this is supported as well. Never use multiple logical assertions. So again, we've got some code here. All right, so we've got our range, we've got our assert, uh, and down here we say, hey, I expect order.client.id to not be null, and order.client.customer name to not be null, right? What I'm doing here is what I would call a single logical assertion. I'm just gonna, right? I'm, I'm checking that this is a client. This is a logical, a single logical assertion. So I could write this as a matcher, my own custom matcher, and that would be fine. And let's say, or expect order.client to be a client, right? And for me, a criteria for a client is it has an ID property and it has a customer name property. Well, I guess, yeah, ID property, customer name property, right? That's a client. And I can, I can write my own custom matcher. If I don't want to go through the effort of writing a custom matcher, then it's fine for me to write these two expect statements. That's totally fine, right? But let's look at this scenario. Here I check um, expect order.client.id to not be null. But I'm also expecting that the order is valid, right? Are those things related in any way? They're not. Now, here's the problem with this, is this, this is what happens, is we write a test where I got my initial state, I have a state change, and then these things result from that, and there's like eight things that result from that. I've got a customer, I've also got to, you know, my order should now be valid, and these are the three things. And so we just go through and we just say, well, I'm gonna test every aspect of the resulting state, all five, six, seven, eight things. The problem with writing a test that way where, you where we test a lot of different completely unrelated pieces is that our test no longer tells us in a simple statement what's going on from state change A to state change B, right? Even if state change B in in includes multiple pieces of state, if those pieces are so somewhat unrelated, then it's very possible for that state to result or for uh, that state change to cause that to be different as our code uh, changes and, and migrates, right? So we shouldn't put multiple logical assertions, different completely unrelated assertions within the same test. Instead, we would write a test that, hey, it should contain a customer by checking the client ID. And we should also write a different test that says, when these things happen, the order should be valid. And when the test fails, we find out that just by reading, the reason it failed is because the order was invalid, right? I was expecting a valid order, obviously the order was invalid, I know what's going on. Or I was expecting there to be a valid client, there wasn't a valid client, I know what's going on. But when I'm testing that the client is valid and that the order is valid and that this thing is this way and this thing is that way and all these random pieces around that they're all true, then I have a test that's kind of a kitchen sink test. So, do not put multiple logical um, assertions, right? It's okay to have multiple physical assertions as long as they're related to each other like I showed with testing two aspects of the client ID. Uh, next one, contain multiple actions. A single test should never contain multiple actions. See here, my initial action is to initialize my customer and I expect that, hey, the orders.length should be zero. Then I add an order and I expect the orders.length to be one. Again, this is a no-no. This should be two tests. All right, final, final brain teaser. This is, my, this is the toughest one. Who's the speaker? Well, say it loud. Schwarzenberger. Everybody get it? If you haven't seen Spaceballs, you need to go see it so you get the joke. All right. Um, my final thing is to keep your tests damp. Code should be dry. What does dry stand for? Don't repeat yourself, right? Tests don't need to be dry, all right? Look at this test here, a set of tests here. I got two tests, line one, customer equals new customer, line two, customer.load data, right? And I got two tests that run those exact same two lines of code. And in a more realistic environment with more complex code, that could be three, four, five, six lines of code, right? So why shouldn't I just refactor it to do this? In my before each, I'll do customer equals new customer and customer.load data, that way I'm not calling the same code. Well, the reason we don't wanna do that, this high level of, oh, I see two lines that are the same, I should refactor those out into some, you know, either my before each or some common method, that I'm a, some helper method. The reason we don't do that is what's called telling the story. And so 
I only have a, a short amount of time here to explain this, but um, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, let's see. Oh, it came up in the wrong order. Who knows what Mulan's father did for a living? Who's, who's seen Mulan? Don't be afraid. This is my favorite, my favorite Disney movie. Okay, of you people who've seen it, who knows what Milan's father did for a living? We don't. We don't know what it's, why? Because it wasn't important to the story. It was important to Milan. She would have known what her father did for a living. She lived in his house. But to us, who are living the story, we don't care what her father did. It's not important to the story. So a test, the it statement, should be the story. The important setup should be inside of the it, and the unimportant setup should be moved to the for each. But the important setup should stay inside of the it. The each test should be a complete story. We shouldn't need to go back up to the for each and glance and see what's going on, right? The test itself, the name of the test, that sort of thing should tell us what the setup is like, the general setup, and then the stuff that's very specific to this test and important should be inside of the it. So that's it, thank you so much. Um, I run Thinkster.io. We are a learning platform. There's a discount code for anybody who's interested in subscribing. It's a, a, an extra big discount that we normally don't do anywhere. You can use code Angular Colorado to get that extra big discount. But thank you so much for coming and letting me talk to you about something that I am highly passionate about, which is unit testing. And thank you.